The Russia Ukraine war has sent the world's economy into turmoil. Falling oil production, increasing gas prices, a rift in the European Union, and changing alliances. During this time, the world has keenly witnessed shifting trends across economic, geopolitical, and cultural lines. But perhaps the most profound impact the conflict has had and continues to have on the world is the acceleration it has provided towards multipolarity. Which is, global power is more evenly distributed amongst several advanced economic nations rather than contained within a single hegemonic power. Which in this case is the United States. Underpinning much of this acceleration, moreover, is the trend of de-dollarization. The US government reaps an unfathomable amount of power from its racket of printing fake money out of thin air and forcing it on the world. The petrodollar system is a big reason it has gotten away with this scam for so long. Any change to this system by default will generate significant effects, not just in prices, but also at the geopolitical and economic levels. Nevertheless, some dismiss these effects as a mere trifle, while others claim them to be cataclysmic. Probably the truth lies somewhere in between. But how did the petrodollar idea come into existence? See, to really understand the petrodollar, we'll have to understand what events actually took place giving birth to petrodollar. Okay? And to do that, we will have to really go back in time to 1928. When King Abdul Aziz Al Saud, or Ibn Saud in short, he was the founder of Saudi Arabia and he developed close ties with the United States. And after unifying his country in 1928, he set about gaining international recognition. And Britain was the first country to recognize Saudi Arabia as an independent state. And that's, that was because British had provided protection to Saudi Arabia from Turkey for many years. And in May 1931, the US officially recognized Saudi Arabia by extending full diplomatic support and recognition. Now at the same time, Ibn Saud granted a concession to the US company, which was called Standard Oil of California, allowing them to explore for oil in the country's eastern province, Al Hasa. And then in 1931, a treaty was signed by both nations which included favored nation status, which means that in 1931, Saudis were given favored nation status by the United States. And then relationship was see, still weak because American interests were not aligning in 1931 in Saudi Arabia, Middle East was not the Americans, it, it wasn't the center of America's foreign policy at that time. So Saudi affairs were really handled by US delegation in Cairo, Egypt. The US finally sent a resident ambassador in 1943. I was one of the lucky fellows to have a chance to shake hands with His Majesty the King. I was very impressed by his size. He was a, a giant of a man. And when his majesty evolved, he thanked God for blessing us with this wealth. The relationship between Saudi Arabia and the United States of America was economically strengthened in 1933 when Standard Oil of California was given the concession to explore Saudi Arabian lands for oil. The subsidiary of this company regarded as California Arabian Standard Oil Company carried out a fruitful exploration in 1938, finding oil for the first time. The relation between the two nations strengthened throughout the next decade, establishing a full diplomatic relationship through a symbolic acceptance of an American envoy in Saudi Arabia. 
as the U.S. Saudi relationship was growing slowly, World War II was beginning its first phase, with Saudi Arabia remaining neutral. The U.S. was deeply involved in the World War II, and as a result, U.S.-Saudi relationships were put on the back burner. This negligence left Saudi Arabia vulnerable to attack, especially from Italy. An Axis power bombed a California Arabian Standard Oil Company oil installation in Tahrain, crippling Saudi Arabia's oil production. This attack left Bin Saud scrambling for to find an external power that would protect the country, fearing further attacks that would most likely seize the country's oil production and the flow of pilgrims coming into Mecca to perform Hajj, the base of Saudi power and the economy at that time. California Arabian Standard Oil Company struck oil near Dharain, but production over the next several years remained low. Only about 42.5 million barrels between 1941 and 1945, less than 1% of the output in the United States over the same time period. California Arabian Standard Oil Company was later renamed the Arabian American Oil Company, aka Aramco. An American destroyer comes alongside a cruiser in Great Bitter Lake on the Suez Canal in Egypt. It brings Ibn Saud, king of the five million people of Saudi Arabia, to a conference with President Roosevelt stopping off here on his return from the Crimea conference. However, as World War II progressed, the United States began to believe that Saudi oil was of strategic importance. As a result, in the interest of national security, the US began to push for greater control over the Aramco concession. On February 16, 1943, President Franklin Roosevelt declared that the defense of Saudi Arabia is vital to the defense of the United States, thereby making possible the extension of the land lease program to the kingdom. Later that year, President approved the creation of the State Owned Petroleum Reserves Corporation with the intent that it purchase all the stock of Aramco and thus gain control of Saudi oil reserves in the region. However, the plan was met with opposition and ultimately failed. See, Roosevelt continued to quote the government. However, on February 14, 1945, he met with King Ibn Saud aboard USS Quincy, discussing the topics such as country security relationship and the creation of a Jewish country, aka Israel, in the mandate of Palestine. Ibn Saud approved the U.S.'s request to allow the U.S. Air Force to fly over and construct airfields in Saudi Arabia. The oil installations were rebuilt and protected by the U.S. The pilgrimage routes were protected and the U.S. gained as much needed direct route for military aircraft heading to Iran and Soviet Union. The first American consulate was opened in Dahran in 1944. America needed to lease an airport and Navy refueling station for its war against Japan. But it was the security of the Saudi Kingdom that was at the forefront of King Abdulaziz's concerns. He requested U.S. military assistance and training, and they agreed to construct the Dahran military base. In return, the king guaranteed that the U.S. would always have secure access to Saudi oil. In 1945, after the World War II, Saudi citizens began to feel uncomfortable with the U.S. forces still operating in Tehran. In contrast, the Saudi government and the officials saw U.S. forces as a major component of the Saudi military defense strategy. As a result, Ibn Saud balanced the two conflicts by increasing the demands on U.S. forces in Dharan when the region was highly threatened and lowering it when their danger declined. At this time, due to the start of the Cold War, the U.S. was greatly concerned about the Soviet communism and devised the strategy of containing 
the spread of communism within the Arabian Peninsula, putting Saudi security at the top of Washington's list of priorities. Harry S. Truman's administration also promised Bin Saud that he would protect Saudi Arabia from Soviet influence. Therefore, the U.S. increased its presence in the region to protect its interests and its allies. The security relationship between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. was therefore greatly strengthened at the start of the Cold War. America struck a pact with Saudi Arabia. You gave us oil at cheap prices and we will give you protection. This protection eventually evolved into an American hegemony over the entire Gulf region. And the deal extended to the Gulf region, that this was an American area of influence, and in return for this, it shall be protected from all enemies. See, the US and Saudi Arabian trade relationship has long evolved around two central concepts. Number one, security, and number two, oil. Now, during the 1940s decade, the Middle East region was going through a political turmoil. A series of Arab-Israel wars between 1948 and 49 only bolstered Saudi Arabian security needs. In 1950, Aramco and Saudi Arabia agreed on a 50-50 profit distribution of the oil discovered in Saudi Arabia. In 1951, Mutual Defense Assistance Agreement was put into action, which allowed for U.S. arms trade to Saudi Arabia, along with the United States military training mission to be centered in Saudi Arabia. This relationship prospered thanks to the 1956 Suez Canal Crisis, 1967 Six-Day War between Arab and Israel, 1970. Yom Kippur War, 1982 Lebanon War, then 2006 Second Lebanon War in the region, which made Saudis uncomfortable due to the lack of its own military, and therefore they had to rely on the USA for security needs. So in a way, seeds of petrodollars were planted in 1951, even though this defense deal started to show the fruits later in 1970s. So let me tell you an anecdote about President Roosevelt's meeting with King Ibn Saud. When Roosevelt asked Ibn Saud about the creation of a Jewish country out of Palestine, King Ibn Saud said that whatever happened with Jewish people is a really terrible thing. And this is not human. In fact, King Ibn Saud was very sad and he regretted that situation. But he also added further that however Germans are the reason for the atrocities on Jewish people, so why don't we carve Jewish country out of Germany instead? In fact, Roosevelt wrote a letter to Ibn Saud giving him reassurance that he will not support the creation of a Jewish country without King's approval. But unfortunately, Roosevelt died just four days after writing the letter. And then President Truman took over the office and he voted in favor of creation of a Jewish country, which is now called Israel, out of Palestine. And this was the first time Saudis had faced betrayal of the West. Now we know that Saudi-US relationship has been working until recently, but US relationship with OPEC countries is not good at all. So how U.S. convinced OPEC countries to sell oil in dollar? How dollar became petrodollar? And what is petrodollars anyways? So to find out the answers to these questions and much more, don't forget to watch the next chapter in this series. Chapter 2. The Birth of Petrodollars.